This is a Renegade Media Network podcast. Obviously, you guys know I prefer organizations that flow counter to the mainstream narrative, and I've got the perfect one to tell you about. That would be Texas Scorecard. They were founded back in 2015 by a former Ron Paul Congressional Press Secretary. They are Texas-based, Texas-focused, counter-culture media organization. How cool is this? They've got podcasts, videos, live programming, a really nice print edition. They've got guest commentaries, very popular daily email newsletter that will highlight the biggest stories of the day. You can actually trust these guys without the mainstream leftist spin put on much of the news we unfortunately see these days. Their mission, disrupt statism and reconstitute self-governance. They do not want a seat at the table They want to get rid of the table. They are pro-citizen. They will be your one-stop shop for Texas politics and news. That is for damn sure. I actually mean that because lately I wanted to know some of the stuff that was going on here. I DM'd Texas Scorecard to find out what was going on. They serve those who are tired of being lied to by the mainstream media. That would be you. That would be me as well. They do not align with any party. They work hard to hold lawmakers on both sides of the aisle accountable. Their reporting was directly responsible for taking down the corrupt Republican Speaker of the House, Dennis Bonin. And check this out. The coolest part of this, nonprofit, no paywalls. All of the reporting is always free. You can find them on any social media channel by searching Texas Scorecard, facebook.com slash Texas Scorecard, Twitter at Texas Scorecard, and then they're on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash Texas Scorecard. You can find their free daily newsletter. Sign up for it over at texasminute.com. Go check out Texas Scorecard. You will not be disappointed. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, cause I call the hologram but I am the center inside the placenta of mass. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I'm your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, and I'm stoked to bring you this episode. Some of you guys, I know it. Some of you feel black-pilled, pessimistic about the way things are going. It seems like the world is a clown world right now, and well, it is. But my guest, Sam Jacobs, and I are going to give you guys some good examples and some good reason for optimism. Guys, we're winning. We will win this battle, okay? That's what we're going to talk about, and I, I really mean that. And so does my guest, Sam Jacobs. I reached out to Sam because of this tweet thread. I'll read you really quickly. He says, you know that we're winning, right? The Biden regime doesn't act like a confident ruling cabal. They act like a bunch of insecure posers constantly grasping at straws. The neoliberal globalists are not sending their best. No, they are not. And I met Sam at the RU Texas event here in Lockhart and got to chat with him there. He had a wonderful episode on Free Man Beyond the Wall with Pete Quinones. Highly recommend that episode. The way he analyzes our culture and the political situations that we find ourselves in currently, it's really brilliant and lots of nuance to it. It's really well thought out. And again, in this case, it will bring you some optimism. And so that's what we're here to talk about. He's got a great substack. We'll talk about it at the end. He's the lead writer and chief historian with Ammo.com and is the driving intellectual force behind the content over in the Resistance Library. He's been published at Bloomberg USA Today, but also Zero Hedge and the wonderful site LouRockwell.com. Sam Jacobs, welcome to the show. How are you? Good man, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm I'm stoked. I've wanted to be on your show forever. So wow, well that's that's a nice compliment. Um, I got to meet you in person here at the RU Texas uh, live event that we had, and uh, I will say this: they can't see you. The people watching this video can't see you. That's y'all's loss. He's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's y'all's loss. Um, also, uh, 
you had a pretty cool guest on the Resistance Library this week, but we don't have to get into that guy. Um, for for those of my those listeners in my audience that are unfamiliar with what you do, can you talk about ammo.com, what you guys do there, and the Resistance Library, and really anything you feel uh, free to share, go ahead and share it. Yeah, so ammo.com, uh, we sell ammunition. You can go to ammo.com forward slash Sam and get a little discount. Um, but we also think that it's important that people have a kind of sense of the broader philosophical issues behind uh, personal freedom as well as pressing um, you know, pressing issues of the day that don't have a shelf life of, of 10 seconds. We try not to really wade into the like day-to-day of this and that, but um, we do like, you know, things like the Great Reset or the war on the suburbs that are kind of going to be going on for, you know, the next couple of few years. Uh, we, we, we like to educate people about those kinds of things as well as, you know, deeper philosophical questions. And the resistance library. Yeah, that's what we do at the resistance library. We also have the podcast, um, which is sometimes us talking about articles that are on the site, sometimes about, uh, you know, what our guests are up to and what they're doing. You know, we, we had you on recently. We've had uh, Dr. Paul Gosar on. Uh, we've had Phil Bishop on. We've had Peter Quinones on. Um, so we have some pretty good guests over there, and it's the same type of thing. You know, I mostly, I approach the podcast from the perspective of, like, like I'm not the interesting part of it. The interesting part of it to me is the guests and kind of what they have to say and these different takes and approaches that are a little more interesting than what you might get from like, you know, cookie cutter conservative or libertarian site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I I, I brought you on here because of a tweet thread that I saw and and I wanted to get you on here anyway. And I saw the tweet thread and I was like, perfect, let's do this because um, there's a lot of pessimism out, out there right now. We've got the worst people on the planet in charge of uh, what a lot of us refer to as the cathedral with the universities and the military industrial complex and the corporate press. Inflation is rising. As you know, uh, beauty's disappearing, it seems like. Uh, People are having to choose between being employed, taking a jab, and it seems like, you know, understandably, a lot of people are black-pilled right now, very pessimistic. I lean naturally towards being an optimist and so I'm, I go through day-to-day life sometimes trying to convince people that it's not going to be as crazy as you think it is. Things aren't as bad. Um, but I'd like to get your thoughts on on why why aren't things going to be as bad as some may say. And, and you kind of said in some of your tweet threads that we will win, meaning us, the good guys, will win this. Why do you have this optimism? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm very much on the same page with uh, Michael Malice in that these people are just, they're just not competent people. I mean, that's kind of first and foremost, the left and the state and its toadies in big tech and big business, woke capital and academia. These are not people who have their positions because they're capable Uh, or because they have arisen through some kind of meritocracy. These are people who have their position because they're very good at jumping through hoops to obtain uh, sinecure positions in academia, these bureaucratic government positions that no one has heard of, you know, until they become Anthony Fauci. And so I think it's worth noting that the thing that distinguishes these people is a lack of creativity, conformity, mediocrity. um, And I think that that informs everything that they do. I don't think that there was some grand plan about Joe Biden. I think quite the opposite. I don't think there was any plan beyond shove him into the White House. Uh, And I think that we're seeing that unfold right now because I don't see what their victories are. I mean, the vaccine mandate is a perfect example. It is encountering mass resistance, mass noncompliance. This has gone way outside the bounds of the type of people who normally resist state edicts to normal people who simply don't think that they should be forced to get a vaccine. 
good old fashioned American laziness has kicked in, stubbornness, uh, American distrust of anything that they're being told to do. And I think that the entire experience of the last two years has been very eye opening for a lot of people in terms of how little good faith they should extend toward these institutions. Um, so I don't, you know, I understand that there's like a lot of bad stuff coming down the pike, but from what I'm seeing, it's all been a giant and colossal failure for the Biden regime and its allies in what one might term uh, the cathedral. It's certainly mm -hmm. a term that I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, and, you know, I just don't see where, I just don't see where they're winning and to like kind of cower every time they come out with some, you know, oh, we're going to look in your bank account if you spend more than $600. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, no, they're not. They're going to try to do that. They're certainly going to try to do that, but this is these machinations of the Biden regime are the machinations of a weak, impotent, insecure regime that is very, very aware of the precarious position it sits on. And I don't want to ascribe too much importance to elections like, oh, the election is going to save us because I don't think that's how it works. But I do think that elections codify, um, you know, fair elections anyway, codify mm -hmm. a, a mood in the um, in the in the in the, po in the in the body politic. Mm -hmm. And I have no reason to doubt that the upcoming elections will be um, fairer than they were in 2000. Um, there seems to have been a lot of movement in terms of securing elections, and I think that we should all be aware of that and applaud that and factor that into our thinking. Um, I also think that the 2022 midterms are going to be a route for the Democrats on the level of 1994, but I think more importantly than that, what we'll see is more Paul Gosars, more MTGs, more Lauren Boberts, more Matt Gateses, more Rand Pauls, more Ted Cruz's uh, in the next Congress. And that's really where, you know, it's less about like making sure that Republicans win by hook or by crook than it is mm -hmm. about uh, moving the discourse towards, uh, you know, people who very unapologetically stand up for freedom, whatever we may think their their foibles and follies are. Otherwise, um, I think that there's a good crop of people in the Republican congressional delegation that are that are solid on the important questions of the day, and uh, that we should engage that. In one of your tweets, you used a phrase that I've been throwing around a lot lately. Uh, I've actually started to think, I hope people get this reference, but you said there's a growing awareness that the emperor has no clothes. And, it, you know, you look at CNN, MSNBC, the New York Times, the White House, uh, what they're spewing out of there. And they've always kind of scripted this fake, fake script, this narrative that's going on, but it's so over the top fake now that you just walk outside, you live real life. And it's, it's obvious that it's not real what they're saying. And I, I think people like yourself and myself have kind of known this instinctively, but, and I'm not trying to brag. It's just because we, we happen to be the weirdos that pay attention right. to these little things that normal people are living their lives and not paying attention to. But it's so obvious now with this, this just fake script that's being pushed on everyone and normal people are going, this isn't real. And just as an example that happened today, I was at my gym sitting in the sauna and it was a, uh, it's a unix, unisex sauna for all you weirdos listening. But um, there's, there's about four or five people in there that I see on a semi-regular basis at the gym. I don't know any of them. I didn't even engage in this conversation because I wanted to be the fly on the wall. They're talking about vaccines, masks, 
and all of this stuff, and they're all on our side. And these are just normal folks that I see at the gym. And uh, when one of them said goodbye, one of the ladies responded with, um, I think there's more people on our side than we realize. And a lot of us are just scared to speak up. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this, the emperor has no clothes phenomenon. It seems to be growing much uh, broader than, than this niche of, of weirdo uh, conservative libertarian podcasters and, and, and media, central, decentralized media types like us. Do you see that as well, that normal folks are looking around going, but this is bullshit? Yeah, I think that like the COVID thing and the election, you know, I don't know what the actual numbers on people who don't fully believe the election results. I suspect it's tens of millions of Americans, um, you know, 10% of America would be a lot. Um, but it's also this thing, you know, this constant inundation on the, the fact checkers on social media, I think has really backfired in a lot of ways because now it's like, fact checkers say is almost like your red flag for, wait a minute, if they're telling me this, then it's probably not true. Um, so I think that these, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, and, and I think that liberals have a sense of this, that there's this distrust of expertise and a distrust of institutions. The difference is that they think it's a bad thing. And I think <laughs> it's a good thing. Right. I mean, I think that the, you know, not to be the guy who's like, oh, the internet, but I mean, clearly the internet has made decentralized media possible. Yes. It's yes. made it possible for people to investigate health claims quickly and easily on their own. I mean, there was that study a few months back about how vaccine, uh, COVID vaccine skeptics tended to be better informed about COVID than, than vaccine, you know, cultists, which didn't surprise me because the, the, um, you know, the, the there's an interesting kind of movement in the in in, in American political discourse where a lot of the people who were uh, leftists during the Bush administration are now somewhere what we could comfortably call on the right, mm -hmm. and I think that that's I, I don't think that that's very confusing at all. I think that if you were a principled uh, leftist opponent of George W. Bush, that you probably are, you know, somewhere on the on the right of the spectrum as it's defined today. Um, I think it's a very common tale, and I think it makes complete and total sense. Um, but one of the things that kind of came with that, you know, I don't know, like these kinds of Oliver Stone movie, Jesse Ventura's Green Party days kinds of like people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the, the skepticism about the medical community um, kind of came in with that. And then there's this concurrent kind of rise of the, you know, granola conservatives or however you want to call it. This kind of conser person who's very um, conservative, usually very religious, but is also deeply concerned about like the hormones and food mm -hmm. or um, making sure that they have access to raw milk or organic yes. produce or things of that kind of nature. And so, and, and, and these ideas are much more mainstream than they were. And I think part of this is an age thing. I think part of it's just that like guys, my age and your age, and we're about the same age, um, have kind of come of age and are the more, are more dominant in the, culture now in terms of like big spending habits and things like that. And what that brings is, you know, this, this kind of shift in the focus to things that matter to us. And, you know, the healthcare stuff has always been kind of lurking around in the background of wherever I've found myself um, politically and, you know, disclosure, like I, I, I voted for Ralph Nader twice. I mean, I, um, but uh, you know, and now I'm a, Trump guy. Um, so I'm representative of this, of this yeah. move. Um, but I think that what, where the kind of common ground is found between them and, um, you know, economic libertarians and, and, and different, these sort of disparate forces that I think are coming together to resist tyranny in this country is really just as simple as that, is that they're all being impacted by the various and sundry tyrannies of the Biden regime in different ways and um, they're all coming together, you know, to fight on these 
really very concrete issues. You know, it's not about this lofty idea of freedom or anything like that, though I think mm-hmm. that that can kind of be folded under the the social aspect, because I think that there's a, there's a kind of like social um, conservatism now that Mm -hmm. you find even among libertarian types that I would summarize as just being the American way of life is like what you're trying to preserve. It's not so much a religious thing. It's just like, you know, I want to drive a pickup truck and be able to start a business and not have to use uh, lights that don't actually light my house up. And, you know, I don't want to live in a pod and eat bugs <laughs> kind of, kind of stuff. But that's, that's really like, I mean, that I, to me is another huge white pill because there's so much organizing around these very, very critical, very, very visceral issues. And that I think is really where the shift has come in is that, you know, the TSA, you go, you deal with it for five minutes and it's a pain and you resent it. And it's, you know, it's humiliating people. It's grooming you for police state. It's fascism. I hate it. I hate everything about it, but it's, it's just simply not the same as the uh, 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 offensive that's being waged to force people to get vaccinated and the concurrent and obviously overlapping um, drive kind of generally to just bring everyone into this, um, neoliberal, you know, quasi-fascist Amazon Prime mm-hmm. hive mm-hmm. existence that I think everyone kind of, everyone politically aware kind of sees, and they may not be able to fully articulate, you know, what it is, but I think that they they, they kind of see these things and instinctively react against them. What's up, Counterflow audience? If you're listening to this show, obviously you're a person who cares about their liberty. You may even be one of these people that's kind of tired of waiting around for political change, tired of being upset by the same old, same old from the LP, tired of all of this nonsense while you think, what should I really be doing? If you're ready to take matters into your own hands, then I want to tell you about a new community called the Nomad Network. The Nomad Network is the number one community for liberty-minded people just like you and me who want to create freedom in their lifetime by focusing on the things that you can actually change, entrepreneurship, investment, and income mobility. The people over at the Nomad Network, Jason Stapleton, these guys are preaching how to actually make your life more free and better without having to join a political party and go through the same old motions year after year. Whether you have an existing business looking to start one or simply want to network with other like-minded people, the Nomad Network is the place for you. The best part is, obviously, everyone likes this. It's free to join. You hear me? Free to join. Go to www.nomadnetwork.app slash buck right now to see what everyone is talking about. That is www.nomadnetwork.app slash buck to get your free account today. See you there. You were on uh, Pete's show, Free Man Beyond the Wall, a couple of weeks ago. And for my audience that hasn't heard that, I I, I told Sam, uh, to me, that was one of the best podcast episodes of 2021 um, on on any show. And, And you made a comparison that I thought was really well put, and I hadn't put it into looked at it through this lens before. But between prohibition and the vaccine mandates, can you kind of make that again really quick for my listeners on this show? Because it kind of was a white pill for some who who fear that these mandates are going to be over the top, and it, it was an interesting lens to look through it. So I am like not a materialist. I do not have a materialist view of reality. And one of the things that that means is that I believe in like national character. I think that there's, you know, characteristics of Americans that make them Americans. And one of the things that I think makes Americans, Americans, one of our kind of common characteristics is that we're intensely stubborn people. And we will kind of put up with some red tape and some bureaucracy, but we don't really like being ordered around in our daily lives. And prohibition is an excellent example of Americans just saying, no, I'm not going to comply with that. 
they don't have any kind of analysis of you know the state and its proper role or anything like this. They just want to get a drink. And I think that what we're experiencing in response to the COVID cult right now, in terms of the vaccination mandate, certainly, but also in just in terms of the masking mandates, the hoops that people are who have been expected to jump through, um, I think that what we're seeing is just, you know, the laziness of Americans is not a fabricated thing. I mean, I will drive my truck from Walmart to Brugger's Bagels on the other side of the um, strip mall, like and as I'm sure many <laughs> of you also do. Um, and there's lots of hoops to jump through, you know, the, the level of, of involvement and compliance. Um, and then you have just the skepticism of, the government is telling us to do this, which by the way, I don't know that there's any data on this, but I do know that there's data that some of the lowest vaccination rates are in the black community, which is funny mm -hmm. because, you know, the, 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 the narrative is like, oh, it's these dumb MAGA rednecks that won't get vaccinated. And I am dying to know what percentage of uh, what they call vaccine hesitancy in the black community is in response to like Tuskegee experiment stuff, um, I would suspect that it's non-negligible. Mm -hmm. So again, like this is kind of, I think that people need to like kind of undo their training in terms of thinking about things like they're Democrats, small d. Like, I don't care if 50% plus one are getting the vaccine and not resisting anything. It matters not at all to me because if 10% of people are doing something in a country of 330 million or whatever, that's a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. So when I say, you know, I'm sure that it's a non-negligible portion of the black community who are not getting vaccinated because they don't trust the very concept of a government vaccine, you know, call it 5%. That's a lot of people, man. And you know, and and the thing too is when you're talking about kind of more organized forms of resistance, not just this kind of passive stubbornness, laziness, skepticism, you know, that first 5%, that's the hardest thing in the world to get. Uh -huh. Once you have that, you know, you need those low numbers to be the first people, the first, the first movers. Um, so I think that really what we're seeing now is 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 that these kinds of like you know, first movers in resistance, but it's the genie's out of the bottle at this point. I mean, I just don't see how they're possibly going to do the vaccine mandate, particularly given places like, and people are going to be shocked by this, Boston. Mm. And it's because of, of the clout that the building unions have. You know, who's some of the biggest resistors of the vaccine mandate? The postal workers union. Why? because no one tells the postal workers union what to do. And no one tells the electricians union in Boston what to do uh, or Philly or New York or, you know, Chicago or like any of these cities where unions have a lot of cloud, you know, and if there's 30, 25, 20% of guys in the local of the electrical linemen's union who are going to look for a new job, rather than get vaccinated, that's a gigantic problem from a number of perspectives. First of all, they're difficult to replace right? Uh, because it's an extremely dangerous job that many people are unwilling to do. And it's also that there is in Northeast, particularly in the Northeast, so it's not limited there. It's just where they have the most clout. Um, there's a very strong culture of, you know what, I got vaccinated, but uh, Jim and Steve didn't, and they say they're not going to, and I don't think they should lose their jobs because they don't want to get vaccinated. So we're not going to go to work or we'll do some like the Southwest pilots did mm -hmm. the work to rule thing. I mean, they have, con they have contracts, like people who, who haven't worked union jobs don't know this, but like the whole, the whole, it's not my job stereotype. Um, they, they, they have that that's in their contract and they are very much allowed to say, I will only do the absolute bare minimum, which is what the Southwestern pilots did. Um, so I think that what we will see is 
um, not much happening and then much happening very, very quickly as we approach mm. the deadline. I think some places will definitely move forward and be stupid like New York State and fire all their nurses. But I think most places will have will have to flinch. And I think that they'll particularly, um, you know, I think that the weird, the strange bedfellows of where they flinch on this will be mm-hmm. northeastern, strong, democratic machine cities where you need the union and, um, you know, places like, I don't know, uh, Omaha mm-hmm. or Topeka or Santa Fe or whatever else where there's just like, you know, the the non-compliance is so great and the local state slash local political structure contains within it enough sympathy. Again, you have to stop thinking like a Democrat. I'm not saying they need a Democratic or Republican controlled city council. I'm saying they need one or two people on city council who are, who are sympathetic, can get things done and can move the ball enough in their direction to effectively nullify the mandate. And I think that that's what we're going to see all over. I think we're already seeing it, but I think it will. I think that's going to be the trend, and I think it will be tons of egg on the face of the Biden regime. Mm-hmm, I hope so. It, today, as we record this, OSHA suspended the vaccine mandate due to I think it was the Fifth Circuit Court because of the rulings uh, through that court. Uh, I you know I don't know that this means like. You know, I didn't want to run around and celebrate the final victory, but I, I think it is important to point out small victories as we work up to winning the war, ultimately. Does this help our case quite a bit, or is this one of those procedural things where it just goes bounce, bounces back to another court and then it happens again, and then are we in that kind of fight? What? How did you see this uh, OSHA pulling back on their vaccine mandate? Well, I thought it was a big victory. Um, I'm I'm certainly sure there'll be more judicial wrangling over it, um, but that's to be expected. That's mm-hmm. part of the process. That's part of the game. That's why, you know, um, I know that there's tons of Republican appointed judges who are no good and totally useless, but there's also tons that are doing stuff like this. Yes. Um, so, you know, I think that this is a big victory because, I think that it's a blow against the concept of the administrative state making yes. up and enforcing laws. Uh, they weren't, you know, no legislation was passed. Mm-hmm. They simply used OSHA to do this. And I don't think it's going to fly when it hits the courts. Um, I think that this is a per- prime example of the type of thing that I'm talking about, where it's like they say, you know, they can say they're going to do anything. And the question is, are the courts going to accept it? Mm -hmm. Are the states going to accept it? Because there's various ways that the states can hamstring the feds. You know, these like Second Amendment sanctuary laws and similar nullification laws that they pass, these are not, um, these are not for show. Um, what this means is that the the federal government can expect at best non cooperation from state and local authorities in, in an ATF case um, to enforce an unconstitutional gun law. At best, they can experience non compliance, uh, non cooperation. There are sheriffs in the United States who openly say that if they catch mm-hmm. ATF agents working in their county. They are getting escorted to the, to the county line with instructions to not come back. Um, and this is just examples from the world of the Second Amendment. Now, you've also seen sheriffs, county governments, local governments, state governments working to uh, nullify or hamper the federal government with regard to uh, the Second Amendment, but also with regard to the COVID mm-hmm. cult most notably in Florida, but things like, you know, this um, ban on vaccine passports throughout the state of Texas that Mm -hmm. was giving certain libertarians the vapors on Twitter a couple (laughs) weeks ago. Um, You know, there's all kinds of things that the state and local governments can and are doing. And 
this is really where the fight is going to happen, I believe. I mean, I think that the federal government is important and controlling it and using it to the best of your ability is important. I don't think that abdicating and testing for power is a viable solution uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that the local stuff is much longer lasting because there's a there's a uh, there's a there's a certain necessary uh, pendulum of uh, oscillation in American national politics where things you know are necessarily going to bounce between one party and the next and you know the kinds of like uh, um, you know the, the country will eventually swing back towards something like Obama era kind of technocratic mm -hmm. adult in the room smart guy, uh, wonkish liberalism. I think that we can all assume that that will probably happen at some point during our lives. But your state government can be, you know, your state government more or less for your entire life. And um, so, and your local government certainly can, and you can use your local and state governments to ensure that the kinds of radical changes that people want to bring about in your way of life you don't happen uh, where you are, and you can also leverage them to do things that are repellent to liberals who want to move to your area, like banning uh, banning vaccine mandates throughout the state or banning mask mandates throughout the state. Uh, the the heartbeat ban in Texas is another yeah. good example. Yes. Um, you know, there's all um, defunding public schools through various means because this is like they they're in love with public schools um so i think that like if you are black pilled you're not thinking creatively enough about the various ways that you can fight back and you're not paying attention enough to the various ways that we're winning right now where's the biden regime winning by the way where's their big victory yeah Good point. I, uh, yeah, I need my producer to insert the cricket noise <laughs> <laughs> right there. That is a good point. Uh, yeah, it seems like L after L after L. Uh, I want to. And ask they look you, ridiculous doing it too. Yes. It's like not only do they lose, but it's it's the most like you know Mr. Bean farcical. Like I mean, it's a it's a he's a it's a whole regime is a Monty Python sketch. Mm hmm. And it's not like this is some, you know, thing like some stupid thing like Obama was born in Kenya mm -hmm. or like George Bush looks like a monkey or some stupid kind of like, you know, thing that only the partisans really pay any attention to and is kind of cringe and irritating anyway. It's like, <laughs> no, this guy is not like he's demonstrably not there we know he's not running anything yeah does any serious person believe that joe biden is in charge of this country yeah and, and as boomery as the let's go brandon thing is in spirit i i i actually really appreciate it that there's this organic grassroots thing that's just yeah. spreading through sports arenas throughout the entire country the i went to a raiders game in vegas and it broke out there of all places. And so that spirit, I, I, I truly appreciate that that is going on. Um, yeah. And they're like, let's, let's talk about the let's go Brandon thing for a second. Cause okay. I think that that's like a per, another perfect example of it, because what you talk about, it's just, they break out into these chants at sports games and you're right. It's very, very boomer. It's like, it's, 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 you know, sensible chuckle, uh, Babylon B kind of like, <laughs> thing but it's really caught on and it's really expressed people's outrage and the degree to which it infuriates the left is like it's like because it's so boomer it's so wildly out of proportion yes to like how you should react to it because how you should react to it is to just kind of roll your eyes and move on because it is this kind of stupid thing but it's not because on the one hand, people have have it's be it's just it is the rallying cry against the, against the regime, mm -hmm. like it or lump it. It's just what it's just what people have picked. And then on the other hand, there's 
like, you know, we need to have a serious talk about the threat to our sacred democracy that Let's Go Brandon presents. (laughs) And it just presents this additional opportunity to showcase how foolish these people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well put. Uh, I want to ask you also about not just the optimism and and, and even the clown world (laughs) that we're living in right now, because it certainly is that. Um, I want to get your thoughts on how we kind of got here to this neoliberal hellscape that we're in right now. It's not like 2020 happened and boom, you know, we're in this COVID uh, tyranny world all of a sudden. Obviously, if you're paying attention, there's been uh, Rubicon crossing moments that have led to, to where we're at right now. Can you talk about that, at least in modern history and and kind of some of the bigger moments that have put us on this path to this crazy world that we're in right now? Well, I think that you can't have this conversation without talking about 9-11 and the massive intrusions that took place after 9-11 and the kind of culture of uh, fear that was used for political gain during Mm -hmm. those time period. Uh, Obviously, the war on drugs would be another example, but I think it really, if we want to look for a genesis of it, um, I think it's the welfare state and the new society or yeah. the great society uh, programs of LBJ is kind of really where things went off uh, the rails in this country. Uh, there's also, you know, the 65 is a big year because there's mm-hmm. the Civil Rights Act, um, which I think there's, you know, valid criticisms of. I'm certainly not any kind of proponent of segregation or anything like that, but I think that there's... Um, legitimate functional and philosophical criticisms to be made of the civil rights uh, acts that that were passed um i i you know Rand paul's views on it are basically mine and you can google them if you're interested yes. um and, and and ron paul's views <laughs> um Rand, no Rand as well i believe is yeah said, yeah, yeah. Know, that's that, i just meant both of them yes yeah, yeah. right yeah. exactly exactly i mean it's not like it's it's not some kind of fringe you right. know, neo neo confederate thing, right. um, so um, but th- there's there's that, and then there's the uh, the welfare state, which I think pretty clearly the evidence is in that the welfare state encourages fatherlessness. Fatherlessness leads to generations of of young men who um, have you know, I mean, the, there's all kinds of statistics I could cite, but there's like s- silly things like. Um, you know, shaking a man's hand firmly and looking him in the eye when you greet him that like entire generations of young men haven't received instruction in how to act at a job interview, yep. um, how to ask, a, you know, the whole like industry of pickup artist coaching comes yep. out of the fact that like people don't have their dad to tell them how to ask a girl out on a date. Um, so I think that it really like this is kind of the it's not my personal, you know, unique analysis, but kind of where where a lot of my uh, political priors come from is the idea that that in the '60s we really saw hierarchy fudged, uh, and I and legitimate hierarchy, you know, the hierarchy of father and child, um, the hierarchy of local communities, and the kind of decentralized patronage networks that existed. I mean, it's the whole kind of bowling alone thing. Like the Elk Mm -hmm. Club used to be a big deal. And now it's like, it's a bunch of old men sitting around drinking beer. Um, But there's all kinds of social capital that's been lost. And there's not any real way to put the put the ship back together. I mean, I'm a pessimist. It's funny that you keep talking about me as an optimist, because I actually I think of myself as being a pessimist in a, in a philosophical sort of way. Like I think that kind of, you know, the world just kind of goes from bad to worse on a long enough time scale because <laughs> when things break, it's not easy or sometimes even possible to put them back together. And I'm not really, I don't have any answers for how we address the problem of fatherlessness. I mean, I think getting rid of the welfare state and replacing it with something that encouraged family formation would be, would potentially be a solution, but I, you know, I don't know. Um, But I think that it basically is that people have become atomized through the destruction of the family, through the destruction of the church as a uh, institution of moral authority in the West, through the destruction of 
civil society and its replacement with these NGO um, organizations, which, you know, are like basically the state anyway, um, but, you know, kind of a grosser, more malevolent um, version of it. And yeah, I mean, I think that that really is like the, the genesis of it. Um, I think that there's there's issues. I think that there's like, um, there's a way that that ball gets rolling as well, where there's like second and third order effects of fatherlessness and a lack of a moral center in your society. Um, and I think that where we have arrived at as a culture in the West which I think is deeply is like, that's the deeply troubling thing is that we've arrived at this culture of hedonism in the West mm -hmm. where the political demands of liberalism are no longer about, you know, making sure everyone gets a fair shake and making sure people get um, equal access to the levers of power or what, you know, whatever these kinds of like, and I have a critique of that style of liberalism but it's like, it's under, people relate to that. It's understandable. It's like, oh, I get it. You want to, you know, you want everybody to have a fair shake. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not the ethos of liberalism anymore. The ethos of liberalism or leftism or however you would want, you know, cultural Marxism, however you want to term it, is that I should be allowed to be anything that I want at any moment of my choosing and that infinite resources should exist to indulge me in that and that everyone has to ag also agree that I am the thing that I um, say that I am. And I think that the, uh, the, the trans madness is maybe the most um, extreme and troubling version of it for reasons that Camille Paglia talks about and mm -hmm. how transvestitism is this sort of harbinger of civilizational doom historically. Yes. Um, and this is just, you know, historical record that like transvestitism as a mass phenomenon and culture tends to accompany social um, decline. And I, I believe that to be true. And I think that there's some um, reasons for why that is, but in any event, I don't think it's limited to that. I mean, I think that the whole, I mean, even like, you look at it as something like um, Instagram and how it's full of people who like, you know, I'm a model and it's like, yes. you're not, you're just right. some girl who has a, who has an iPhone and knows how to use filters and, 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 and that, you know, these kinds of like um, expectations that people have that like, they just should be, you know, the kind of culture of instant gratification, but it, it goes mm -hmm. beyond consumerism at this point and into politics. I mean, the, the free college thing is like a really, is like a really good um, example of it in terms of policy, because there's never any thought given to like, what would that look like? How would that be implemented? What impact might that have on the job market, on the you know, macro economy on this or on that. Um, it's just, you know, I want to mm -hmm. study French poetry for four years. And so I, you know, somebody needs to pay for me to do that because that's my dream and, you know, uh, personal fulfillment and these, I mean, it is kind of a consumerist thing, but like it's, it's, if, if we're, if we're limited to consumerism, it'd be damaging enough, but it's not. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what a brilliant little rants on, uh, <laughs> Really, your cultural analysis is 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 really refreshing and, and quite uh, insightful. The best part about having PalomaVerdeCBD.com as a sponsor is not even that the products are amazing, because they are. That's not even the best part. It's once you order these products and use them over and over, you know, because I'm telling you that you're supporting a truly good couple, the people behind PalomaVerdeCBD.com, Carlos and Vanessa out of San Antonio, very wonderful people, hardworking and very much like-minded. And they're providing you these wonderful products, the mint CBD tinctures. Check this out, the sleep bundle. I know sometimes some of you have issues sleeping. It's very common these days. You won't once you buy their sleep bundle. They've got the CBD gummies, of course. They've got soft gels, sav sticks, 
I've ranted and raved many times about the cool menthol sports cream. Those of you guys and ladies that work out and lift and you get a little sore, I'm telling you, this is the absolute best sports cream I've ever used. And you've heard it many times, but I can't brag enough on their pet products, the CBD dog chews and the pet CBD tinctures. Both of my French Bulldogs, George and Lux, both use these products. They may not know they use them, but I can tell you, Lux is the old one. He used to kind of waddle around like a little old man French Bulldog. I put the CBD tinctures on his food every morning, and now he can actually keep up with his younger brother, George, who darts around the yard and chases squirrels. But I put these CBD dog chews and the pet tinctures in their food every morning and every evening. You will not be sorry if you give these guys business, help out your sleep, your muscles, your anxiety. They've got stuff for that, of course, and your pets. Everything here is wonderful and good, as are the people behind the business. And of course, since they support this show and you listen to this show, you get 25% off your entire order when you type in promo code BUCK. That's me, of course, BUCK, B-U-C-K, at checkout. Gets you 25% off of your order when you go over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Please give these great people some business. You will not be sorry. And you're helping out the Counterflow podcast. You're helping us keep the lights on, as they say. That's PalomaVerdeCBD.com, promo code BUCK. Get you 25% off. Let's get back to the show. I want to ask you this one. Should Christianity play a bigger role in pointing us in the right direction to get out of this mess? Well, I think that if I'm being very honest, you know, I think that there are two, um, I would say that there are two consistent worldviews that a person can have. One of them is the egoism of Max Stirner, which is that nothing, there is no morality, nothing matters. I'm grossly oversimplifying. So like Sternerites can stay out of my mentions on this, but like, you know, the only thing in the world that really matters is like my ability to control, dominate, um, get what I want out of life and this and that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a like completely consistent um, worldview. And I think that the other consistent worldview is Christianity. Um, and I am Catholic. Um, I'm certainly not the world's best Catholic by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that it is impossible to build any kind of sane and ordered society without religious values. Um, certainly it's simply not true that it's impossible to build a sane and ordered society without Christianity. We can, anyone can off the top of their head, think of, you know, half a dozen societies that didn't have Christianity that were well-ordered and, uh, you know, societies with high culture and et cetera. Uh, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, I don't, um, first of all, I accept Christianity to be you know, factually true. Um, but I also think that in terms of the West, you know, and my view on this is like, I have like my view of religion in the West is basically what, um, there was a phrase that I tripped over while researching something for ammo.com. And it was, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who I think is one of the greatest presidents this country ever had. And he said, and I don't care what it is, is the like Googleable phrase and what he's talking about is religious faith. And I, from a like, you know, political, social perspective, um, agree that like, I don't really, I genuinely kind of don't care what people's religious expression is so much as that they have one and that the one that they have is not, well, religious values just change to mold to contemporary liberalism. Yes. And that's, you know, that cuts out a, huge chunk of religious expression in the West today, which is all about like, how do I shoehorn Christianity yes. uh, or, you know, Judaism or um, some kind of, you know, meme religion that I picked up to seem exotic yes. into my liberal worldview. Um, and I think that what I like about, 
you know, people of uh, varying faiths is when they have a worldview that includes a timeless and eternal set of values that don't require any justification that are just accepted as being uh, moral principles. Because I just simply don't, I don't know how you live with people who, I mean, this is the thing too, people hear this and they're like, oh, well, you don't think you can live next to an atheist. And it's like, that's, I'm not even saying that like I distrust individual atheists. What I'm mm-hmm. saying is that the prevalence of a lack of faith in society um, has consequences that I think are important. You know, individual atheists are like, I could kind of care less, like that's between you and God and that's your, that's your deal. But like as a social, as a social institution, I just don't know how you function with people who have a wildly different set of uh, who, who who live in a wildly different moral universe than you. And I think that like one of the shortcomings of the right in general is that they ascribe their kind of moral code to the left who much more yeah, yes. uh, resemble the, I mean, I, was, I wish they were like smart and consistent enough to be Sternerites, but like that kind of, you know, the end justifies the means. The yeah, left yeah. doesn't have any problem. Right. any problem whatsoever with that and they will weaponize your faith yes and your values i mean like how you've heard this and i think most people who have any kind of religious worldview do have like well jesus would want you to take infinity third world uh gangster immigrants and let them pop up tents on your front lawn yeah. oh and by the way i think that your religion is stupid yeah you know like these people are not like appealing to your religious sensibilities out of a place of good faith. Or if you're not religious, you're like your philosophical convictions from a place of good faith. They're trying to weaponize them to like trick you into agreeing with them. And it's, you, Do you know, don't argue with these people in good faith. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Ed Sabatini was on saying the exact same thing in a similar manner. It's m- more so against the, a lot of libertarians get stuck in, and people on, on the right in general get stuck in this, well, you can't legislate against vaccine passports, that you can't make them illegal. That's going against our principles. Those are private businesses. They should be able to do what they want. And Those are the suckers that get run over by the left because the left will latch on to that argument for just just enough to get ahead and win. And these idiots are standing there, you know, basically with that written on their grave. But my principles and it's it's I call it I call it free free market cultural Marxism. Yes, it's like you let you let the cultural Marxists get whatever you whatever they want as long as they use the the free market to do it. And I think that like you know, I mean. There's like the term free market is so loaded and carries so much baggage and 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 bears so little resemblance to like what we have in the right. West from the Federal Reserve on upward that it's so you know, particularly in the case of big tech, but like I, I mean pick your pick your favorite Fortune 500, the degree to which they're suckling at the teeth of your tax dollars while they're finding ways to use the market mm-hmm. to, um, you know, take your rights away. I just like, I don't have any, um, the, the principle here for me is looking out for myself and my liberty. So yeah. it's like when, when, you know, when a, when a big company is defying a ban on masks and gets prosecuted by the state of Texas for, or whatever, I'm on the side of the state. And when, you know, the, um, when, uh, when in and out burger is getting uh, hassled by the state for not checking vaccine passports at the door, I'm on the side of in and out. And I don't think like, to me, it's not inconsistent. Right. To me, it's inconsistent. The to inconsistent, you know, the, the the foolish the foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of little minds kind of kind of thing. And it's like, yes. do you want to win or what? You know, are you are you serious about confronting these people, or is it just this intellectual 
parlor game for you because yes. I'm certainly not somebody who thinks that philosophy and kind of deeper questions of ethics uh, don't matter. I think that they do matter. I think aesthetics matter. I think all these things that are supposed to be lofty and don't matter. I think they absolutely matter. But at the end of the day, my goal with regard to vaccine passports and vaccine mandates is to prevent people from feeling coerced into getting vaccinated, whether that's their employer or their or the, or or the state. And I think maybe this is like where, you know, the kind of like this kind of Bush era, um, you know, libertarian sympathetic leftism comes in is that like I have enormous amounts of distrust for large institutions of any kind whatsoever, be they corporations, be it the state, be it NGOs, be it the military. Um, what you know international organizations whatever whatever it is that's a big big uh heavy large footprint kind of organization with lots of money and clout i don't trust them mm -hmm. because i just assume that their interests are in variance with mine now i do i think that there's like individual members of the elite whose interests align with mine yes i do um you know Peter Thiel is a good mm. good example of somebody who I feel that I have aligned interests with. I don't know that he would want me at one of his you know parties, but um, <laughs> we certainly have aligned political interests. Dave Portnoy is another yes. example of of this. Uh, and in the, the corporate sphere, you know, as I said, in an outburger or any of these companies that don't want to have to comply with this. But the friend enemy distinction is 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 really. A thing that the right, I think, has become in increasingly comfortable with, but still has so much work to do in terms of thinking about this less in terms of operating from an abstract set of principles and, and instead operating from a friend-enemy distinction that's informed by a set of principles. And I think that what you'll find is that the, the the whole question of principles really is like, it becomes kind of a red herring because this is not, you know, you're not being like asked to push the button at Hiroshima here. You're like being asked to ally with, um, you know, you're being asked to forge a temporary alliance with state and local state authorities to prevent people from being coerced into taking an experimental vaccine at a time of intense psyoping and propaganda to force people into getting it or lose their livelihoods. And I think that when you consider it from the position of like, again, the question is, what increases liberty? You know, what, it, what, what increases liberty? And I just don't see a serious argument that um, allowing for these vaccine passports is going to increase liberty other than in these very abstract, you know, what about the rights of the business owner thing. And I think that while I am not entirely indifferent to the concept of that, um, I think that the political realities of the day demand that we you know, oppose any kind of vaccine passport. Because if we don't, there's never, there's never, like, this is it. This is the line. There's never going to be an end to this if we don't say no now. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, but in, we'll close up here in a second. Do you have any, I, I mean, I think you and I both probably have our frustrations with libertarianism at times. Just give a few words of advice for libertarians that are listening to this. That and, and maybe to avoid some of the pitfalls that you see them taking? Well, I think that the biggest problem that I have with libertarianism is what I was just talking about, is that yeah. libertarians are not serious about power. I mean, I think there's been a lot of um, movement in the right direction with regard to the libertarian 
movement. I think that there's a lot of libertarians who kind of chafe even at being called libertarians these days. Yes. Um, because, particularly after the last election. I mean, the last election was such a joke um, with you know the candidate that they fielded and the kind of fallout within the party after that. And you know, there's like, you know, I, I'm sure that there's like people who think that um banning CRT in public schools is like this egregious violation of the NAP that you're hill to die on in the libertarian yep. party these days. And like, I think that much to their credit, a lot of libertarians have just kind of checked out from that. And I also think that that's the push. And then the pull is like, I think is really just as simple as, as DeSantis, you know, you can see that again in figures like Bill Bishop where like, mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's just, it's DeSantis stupid. Like, this country would be Canada or Australia if it weren't for one Republican governor standing up and saying no to the whole thing. But I think that my, you know, my books, I always tell people to read. I mean, The Prince is a good one by Machiavelli, um, but definitely read the, the key works of Lenin. Um, what is to be done? State and Revolution, great books about what the state is, what you're talking about when you say the state, how to organize against um, the state, forming alliances, um, obtaining power. These things I think are very, very important questions because I think that there's like kind of two sides of a political equation. And one of them is when you're trying to get power versus when you have power. And we can see this in the left, like they were very, very concerned about free speech when they were trying to subvert uh, normal society and gain social power. But once they had it, they weren't interested in it anymore. Now it's, there's too much free speech and yeah. um, all of this. And the consistency in that is that they abandoned it when it was no longer useful for their purposes. Um, so I think that there's no need to kind of view this as, is this purely a moral Machiavellian scheming, or is this, you know, principled David French conservatism where you constantly tuck your tail between your legs and, you know, make the conservative argument for drag queen story hour. <laughs> um, I think that there's a very important balance to be struck, but I think that you need to err on the side. Like, this is the thing. It's like, you know, like uh, Alec Baldwin says in Glen Gary, Glenn Ross, always be closing. Like, what's the goal? What What are you doing? What are you achieving? That was the thing that my first boss, my first real job used to say to me is to always be thinking, what, are you, what am I achieving right now? Yeah. And you have to think about this in terms of what are you doing? Um, I, I am not somebody who thinks the words don't matter. I think blogging, podcasting, talking, I think all of that stuff matters. But I think that at the end of the day, the rubber has to meet the road somewhere. You eventually have to obtain and wield power, even if it's in your little corner of the world, because without that, it doesn't matter if you're building parallel communities, you're simply surrounded by people who are hostile to your freedom. Yeah. And debating with them is a waste of your time yep. and, and dangerous, frankly. It's dangerous because these people aren't just indifferent to your freedom. They hate you for it. I mean, I think that like the whole, you know, they hate us for our freedom thing um, that was bandied about during the Bush era. I, I think the world is full of people who hate you for your freedom and they're not halfway around the world in right. Afghanistan. They're right, right across the street. Yes. Um, and there's no reasoning with them. There's no debating with them. There's no convincing them. Uh, there's only stripping them of their ability to harm you. And mm -hmm. that means stripping them of, of, of state power. Um, and there are ways to do that through the active application of state power. And there are ways to do that through the neutering of state power. And I think that people should be open to using both options um, where they are appropriate uh, because this is like, you know, the, my black pill is that this is a critical juncture and this absolutely is like, we're looking at winning or a hundred years of human, at minimum, a hundred years of human darkness. You know, the Soviet Union could only 
couldn't couldn't have gone on forever because it's a, it, I think Rand talked about this that there's like there there are two at variance with reality. Mm-hmm. You know, communism mm-hmm. is at variance with with the very nature of reality. It does not work. It is the proverbial cutting the bottom six inches off of a blanket to make a blanket six inches longer. Mm-hmm. You know, it just it doesn't work, but it can kick around for 80 years and make you real miserable while you're waiting around for it to kind of collapse under the weight of its um, contradictions. And I do think that we're very much in one of these moments where, you know, we are facing um, living in some kind of nightmare abomination that combines the worst aspects of a Chinese slave labor camp with like, you know, the hunger games and Amazon prime and Mm -hmm. the gig economy and all these kind of awful things. But I think that the the white pill and the silver lining is that uh, every time I turn on the news, I mean, I have to like, why run a news aggregator Mm -hmm. Um, news.libertasbella.com. Put in the show notes. And and every morning when I wake up, it's, it's white pills, you know, it's the school board revolts. It's young can winning in, in, in 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 Virginia, which is like, you know, oh, people are like, oh yeah, Youngkin is just some like you know normie Republican. Yeah, Youngkin's what a normie Republican looks like in 2021, dude. Like, yeah. do you have a memory longer than a termite? Right. Do you remember what a normie Republican was like three years ago? Three years ago. Yeah. It, a normie Republican was Lindsey Graham three years ago. Yeah. Lindsey Graham's not Lindsey Graham three years ago. Yeah. You know, like. Right. This is this is what I mean. Is like I don't know what people I don't know what people want. What do you want? What's the what's the bar for success here? Right. Because if the bar for success is like, you know, uh, that we that we like repeal the board of education. Like I'm right there with you, dude. But uh, you know, let's let's take our victories as they come. Yes. And this is there's there's a process to all of this. Things need to play themselves out in real time. You don't go from zero to sixty in 0.3 seconds. You have to go through. It's the it's the it's the problem reaction solution thing that Alex Jones talks about. Mm-hmm. Except it's not just you know that oh it's problem reaction solution and we're constantly getting pummeled down. It's like there's problem reaction solution, but they they don't have the momentum right now at all at all like anywhere it's 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 everything is everything is they they put out some grand edict they make some grand pronunciation they say they're going to do some big thing and then they totally fall on their face in the in the execution of it and look completely stupid in the process and then their toadies in the media are forced to to, to resort to these you know increasingly desperate measures to convince people that the thing that they see happening before their very eyes isn't happening. Yeah. And I'm just sitting here like, how are, how am I getting text messages from people telling me how like we're five minutes away from being shoved in the gulag? That's what happens after, you know, victory. Yeah. That's the victory dance. They don't have a victory to dance about. Yeah. None of the stuff they want is happening. None of it. And so the next time, you know, and I said today on my Twitter, you need to like get a broader lens on your analysis of the day-to-day news than just taking on all of these. um, Think about what the purpose of the media is, right? At its best, it's to drive clicks. That's at its best. At its worst, it's to black pill and demoralize and propagandize and psyop you. Yes. And so you think about it from the perspective of, of, of this person either wants me to click and has, and has figured out some way to pick at the part of me that's going to get me to do that, or they're trying to sigh out me. And then you start reading the news. And every day, you're going to start seeing what are people doing in Loudoun County, Virginia, where they're not, where they're this mass resist, you know, or in Florida or mm-hmm. in Texas or in Arizona or where, or wherever it's happening. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a Pollyanna. I just mm-hmm. don't see anything but victories for us. They're small. 
but they're they're important and significant. All the stuff Rufo, you think you think Chris Rufo is black pilled right now? Right. And that guy's got more on the line than any of us. Yeah. But like, it's it, everything is everything is a little but significant victory. They're very very localized, but I think I think the next election is really going to be um, is really going to be an earthquake, and uh, and I and I look forward to it. Me too. We will win, Sam. We will win. Uh, let's get you to plug away. Plug your Substack before we go. Add your Twitter handle. Anything you want, really. But uh, plug away as we get out of here. Yeah. So Substack. Uh, uh, Substack is uh, there. I have Sam Jacob seventeen seventy six dot Substack dot com. Um, I do sort of more philosophical stuff there. Uh, my Twitter is at Sam Jacob seventeen seventy six. You can check out my podcast, The Resistance Library, if you go to YouTube forward slash ammo dot com, where dot is uh, spelled out D-O-T. And I know you guys want cheap ammo, and I know mm-hmm. that you have trouble finding calibers. Uh, so if you go to ammo.com forward slash Sam, you can get a nice little discount on what's some reasonably priced ammo anyway in, you know, 223, 9, uh, 40, 44, 45, 38 all the common calibers that people look for. And if we don't have what you want, just come back in a couple of days. We restock pretty, pretty regularly. So awesome. Awesome. I will link to all of that stuff in the show notes page for this white pilled, optimistic, very, very uh, brilliantly, uh, a brilliant analysis at, at where things are. Thank you so much, Sam Jacobs for being here. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yep. I'm telling you guys, we will win. We are winning. I hope that gave you some optimism there. And uh, I hope to see some of you guys at the Sayulita Super Spreader event down in Sayulita, Mexico. Let me say it as it should be said, Sayulita, Mexico. I don't have to put that pause in there. Join Peddling Fictions, Johnny Profita, and special guests, Lions of Liberty's Mark Clare, Liberty Lockdown's Clint Russell, Counterflow's Buck Johnson, Borderless Blog's James Guzman, Scottish Liberty Podcasts, Anthony Samaroff, and COVID Jesus, a.k.a. King of the Cox, a.k.a. co-host of the Part of the Problem show with Dave Smith, Robbie the Fire Bernstein. We're going to have a weekend of libertarian fun in the sun. The event takes place in Sayulita, Mexico, a small surf town about 45 minutes north of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where, for all intents and purposes, COVID ceases to exist. There will be multiple live podcasts, talks, stand-up comedy, and countless shenanigans, all taking place with audience participation. And I can personally guarantee we'll be having many a margarita. And so I hope to have some margaritas with some of you guys down there in Sayulita, Mexico. As for this show, the YouTube page, go smash that subscribe button, Counterflow with Buck Johnson there on YouTube. If you need anything, it's at counterflowpodcast.com. And uh, like I mentioned last week, I've got a Patreon page. If you find value in this product that I give, it only takes a dollar to contribute. That's the floor there. All you have to do is give a dollar a month. And that's at patreon.com slash counterflow. It might be slash counterflow podcast. See, I should know these things, but I assume it's 2021. If you guys type in patreon.com and or just Patreon and search with counterflow podcast, you'll find it. You'll find it. And uh, maybe you can find it in the kindness of your heart to donate on that page. And until next week, I will see you guys later. Have a great week. And I hope this gave you some optimism. Take it easy. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. This has been the Counterflow podcast, a part of the Renegade Media Network.